Hello from Beijing. Uh, this is Lei Wang from Chinese Academy of Sciences. Thanks John and David for the kind invitation. It's my great pleasure to talk to you. Uh, differential program intensive networks. This is something I enjoyed uh, for the past few years. I'd like to share with you. So um, my background is quantum many-body computation that is uh, uh, more or less similar with Mars. So um, nowadays, people are talking about uh, extend the field uh, from the software side, that is including some of the different uh, deep learning ideas and technologies. Also on the hardware side, that is uh, trying to uh, program quantum computers for realistic physical problem. So differentiable programming, as far as I can say, sit right in the center of those efforts. So what is differentiable programming? Uh, let me show that to you with this uh, simple concrete example. So consider such a problem. So uh, given the ground state density, how do we design uh, potential? So uh, we are learn about how to solve this uh, forward problem uh, in quantum mechanics 101, right? It's one dimensional. We just diagonalize the Hamiltonian. But how to solve this uh, inverse problem, which I call uh, inverse shorting problem? So uh, there is actually a differentiable programming way. So let's look at this piece of code. Um, by the way, you can also find them uh, through the link here. So you notice that this code is, uh, first of all, it's short. And uh, I was uh, importing Touch, that is a, a machine learning library. And essentially, I'm programming uh, the ordinary forward uh, shorting equation solver using a, a finite difference, right? But basically, I construct the Hamiltonian and diagonalize it to get my ground state here. So um, then, uh, by comparing the target density and uh, the density from that model. So model is a, a term usually we um, get from machine learning. When we, when we talk about machine learning models, usually they are neural network. But here, it's a Schrodinger equation solver. Then I can define my loss function. And then I just pull out one of the optimizers. So you see, we have many things uh, that are uh, in common with machine learning, right? I'm having my model, my loss function, and my optimizer. So we can just uh, Run it and train the model uh, in the same way as training a neural network. So you do see that uh, uh, the current density uh, slowly gets adjusted uh, to the target density, and I'm learning such a uh, quite weird uh, potential to host this uh, target density, which looks like a rooftop. So this is the example, and uh, what was actually the magic? Because essentially, I'm just using the tool and the programming the ordinary solver. So what is under the hood? This is uh, what I want to tell you about differentiable programming and what what was the magic. And then I, we are going to apply that to many physics and machine learning problems. So um, to um, digest. Um, what is under the hood, we need to uh, reconsider this question. So what is deep learning? So we often hear the uh, thing that uh, uh, deep learning people, they just train a neural network. But what does this really mean? What does training a neural network mean? So if you think it uh, uh, a bit deeper, um, it actually means, uh, deep learning means you compose a bunch of differentiable components into a program. So neural network is a, actually a program. Then you optimize the whole program using gradient information, such that the program, that's what you want. So underlying all those uh, uh, generic uh, thinking, uh, the key technique is actually to take gradient through a generic program. So uh, in this sense, I think it's uh, uh, quite rewarding if we can abstract away all those neurons and the biological inspired uh, intelligence and so on. Just uh, uh, think a neural network uh, 
computationally in terms of a so-called computation graph. So basically, it's a way to express uh, dependence of your data uh, in the program. So here, each node is data, and the arrow indicates um, how does the data, uh, how does do the data depends on each other. Uh, in the end, you say you get a loss function, which is a scalar. The uh, forward evaluation on this computation graph basically is the execution of your program. And uh, to uh, consider uh, gradient information, it's better uh, so we can uh, define something called a joint that is the gradient of the loss function with respect to the uh, data. Uh, uh, it has this interesting name, a joint. But anyway, we know that in the end, we have a joint equals to 1, that is by definition. So uh, then the goal is basically to pull this a joint equals to 1 information in the end all the way through the network so you reach all the uh, parameters in the program and possibly also to your data. So this that certainly can be done by uh, applying chain rule. Basically, you multiply all the Jacobian. So, uh, more importantly, this can be done for a uh, more complex computation graph because sometimes we know that uh, certain uh, intermediate result that uh, uh, determines the uh, outcome why different ways, explicit dependence and implicit dependence and so on. But the way to compute, uh, to, or, or let's say to pull those adjoint back through the graph is simple because we just need to uh, think locally. So each node needs to get uh, adjoint information from its child node. And uh, when it gets all those information, it sends the adjoint information back to his parent. So uh, this can be done uh, quite generically on any directed acyclic graph. So uh, essentially to uh, get a joint information, you just pass this information all the way back through the graph. So this can, you, you can see that this can, this is quite uh, uh, efficient. And uh, this is called automatic differentiation. So you get a uh, gradient information automatically on a computation graph representation of a computer program. So it, it has many advantages compared to other ways of computing gradient. For example, uh, this is uh, uh, exact to the machine position and also it's more efficient compared to um, doing numerical finite difference. And theoretically, there is a guarantee that uh, um, the compet Computational complexity of computing gradient is not uh, uh, it, uh, more than the forward evaluation. Moreover, the gradient themselves, they are also a computation graph. That means you can uh, iteratively apply this idea so you get a higher order gradient by uh, doing that repeatedly. So this has found many applications already in scientific application. For example, uh, we know that uh, uh, the gradient of uh, energy with respect to position is a force, so it's a way that's a way to computing force through the computer program and in optimal control in chemistry. You find many applications. So um, with the development and the more understanding of those approach, people is now trying to apply this to more and more complex program. So uh, here the thing is that is that what was differentiated is not a simply ma a mathematical function. It's actually a computer program. So you can see from those examples. I'd like to also highlight this uh, recent example from uh, uh, Princeton. So this is a core design for uh, nuclear uh, fusion reactors. So the idea is basically to uh, confine high temperature plasmas. So, um, when some machine learning people saw it, uh, this really warms their heart because uh, machine learning uh, people enjoy it, um, uh, I would say, significantly uh, from those techniques. So they uh, would love to see many of new apl applications of those set of techniques in uh, many domains. So that was actually the computation graph behind that core design. You see that the input 
is the core parameter. The output can be some physics uh, constraint and engineering constraint, but nevertheless, all through the uh, computation, you had many of the actually domain specific, right? There's no neural network here. Uh, very often you had a physical law, but uh, you can still differentiate through this graph. So um, the punchline is that differential programming is more than training a neural networks. And uh, uh, to really uh, make better of it, um, sometimes we need uh, also a uh, deeper understanding of the tool. So by the way, it's also beautiful. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to uh, bring you some um, common knowledge and uh, understandings of it. Then we apply that to uh, actual problem. So first of all, there can be different ways of computing gradient on a graph. Again, let's take a very simple graph. So now uh, it's just a one-dimensional chain. So uh, remember, uh, <laughs> that's how, how, how we get a chain rule, right? So theta gives x1, x1 gives, gives x2, then all the way to the uh, loss function, error. So <clears throat> we can certainly write the gradient of loss function uh, with respect to the input uh, as this uh, long chain of matrix modification. Then uh, that, that, there are already several ways of evaluating this gradient. So uh, let's consider a quite generic case where theta is high dimensional uh, data, while loss function is a uh, scalar. Then uh, the computational efficient way to compute the gradient is to multiply those matrices from left to the right, because here uh, this Jacobian is actually a row vector, while the others are possibly dense matrix. So uh, this is called reverse mode automatic differentiation, because it factors the computation graph, and uh, uh, that already means uh, a bit of inconvenience because we possibly need to store some of information, intermediate result. But this is very efficient if uh, the loss function is a scalar value, why we want to compute its high dimensional gradient with respect to certain parameter. So the other way of evaluating such a gradient is to multiply those matrices from right to the left. This is called forward mode uh, because uh, we execute, we got the gradient in the same order as the function evaluation. There's no storage overhead. However, computationally, this is more expensive. So um, very often for um, generic computation graph, one thing we need to care about is actually to balance the memory and the computation effort by designing the right way of propagating the loads adjoint. So, the other two of them is uh, try to control the granularity. For example, here, uh, I can actually block two steps into one step and uh, considering uh, the input output Jacobian as uh, uh, what we care about in you know, one step. So in this way, uh, very often we can reduce the memory uh, usage and also increase the numerical stability. So the other important uh, uh, aspect is that in this way, uh, you can wrap up many of those uh, external libraries or external hardware, thinking about a quantum computer. Because what you need uh, is not to differentiate into that machine or into that library. So as long as you had a way to provide the forward and the backward uh, propagation rule, you can stack them together in a very modular way. So this is, again, another quite important design principle when we think about AD. So um, this is, is highly, highly recommended because uh, just by working out close to 100 functions, the gradient uh, of 200 functions, you can uh, make the whole NumPy um, differentiable. So um, this is an uh, autograd library. And, uh, uh, Another important message is that uh, it's not only mathematical functions, so loop, conditions, sort, permutation, many of those control flow and uh, uh, 
kind of non-differentiable operations, they are also differentiable. That, that's because we are actually thinking about the dynamical computation graph. So depending on the data, the topology of that computation graph can actually be different. So nowadays, with the rapid development of machine learning tools, we also had a, uh, a rich um, ecosystem of differentiable programming libraries. I recommend uh, uh, to look at many of those things. So with all this preparation, I guess, it's time for us to think about uh, differentiable scientific computing. That was, uh, first of all, because many of the elementary scientific operations like a fluid transfer, eigen solver, SVD, they are all differentiable. So using those things, people will already build um, differentiable researcher and the fluid simulation. But uh, at least in our domain, I think uh, it's time for us to think about the uh, differentiable through many of those, uh, for example, Monte Carlo, Tensor Network, DFT, Molecular Dynamics, many of those domain-specific uh, computation processes, because this allows us to do uh, learning, control, optimization, and solve inverse problems much easier than before. So come back to that uh, toy problem I showed in the very beginning, the inverse shorting equation. So uh, its computation graph is actually extremely simple, right? The input is the learnable potential, that is a one-dimensional vector. So using that, I build up my Hamiltonian, then I diagonalize it. That gives me my ground state, ground state. Then I just compare ground state density with the target ones to get my density. So it's a one-dimensional chain graph in, for, for the computation graph. And the only non-trivial step is actually the matrix diagonalization, which turns out to be uh, differentiable. So by the way, even though this is a very simple toy problem, it's actually quite relevant uh, to solving inverse quotient problem that is relevant to uh, density functional um, theory. So uh, here, what was uh, uh, used is a so-called differentiable eigensolver. So uh, we all know eigensolver, but we can now consider that as a one step in a, a long stream of uh, computation. So uh, input is the Hamiltonian, output, that's a branch. Right, it's a fan out we call it from the graph perspective. So we get the wave function and the energy eigenvalues. So uh, we heard about uh, two modes of doing automatic differentiation. So to bring that uh, to something that we are already familiar with. So the forward mode was asking uh, the question: uh, What happens if I change my Hamiltonian a little bit? Um, this is actually nothing but the perturbation theory we all learned from uh, quantum mechanics. But the reverse mode automatic differentiation is asking something more uh, slightly different. So we, we had a loss function uh, in the downstream calculation. So now, suppose for some reason I get the uh, adjoint of this uh, loss function uh, for uh, energy or, or or the wave function, so how should how should I send this information back to the Hamiltonian? In other words, how should I change my Hamiltonian so I can minimize the loss function? So I call this inverse perturbation theory. So this is not something we learned in the textbook, but uh, you can imagine when you look at the formulas, it's not uh, so different from what we already know the perturbation theory. So, but this way of thinking, and uh, think in terms of this, uh, uh, in broader perspective, this uh, opens our mind because this can be very useful for Hamiltonian engineering, right? You can just design a Hamiltonian so it has desired property. So, other applications include uh, differentiate through the old ordinary differential equation integrations, as I showed earlier. So, this can be done efficiently, that gives a way to uh, control dynamical systems. And uh, uh, by the way, I would say almost all the physics, like optics, classical and quantum mechanics, and even field theory can be formulated in the uh, way of principle of uh, list actions. But when you look at it, it's a functional optimization problem. And if you do DSDT, so this is actually uh, looks like um, quite a simple ordinary differential equation, 
there is actually a way to perform such a functional optimization problem uh, in uh, the same uh, kind of framework of deep learning. Here I provide another example that is a rapid de the descent problem. So you can look at the code. So suppose uh, John John and uh, Bruni did not solve that 300 years ago for us. Now, just by parametrizing a uh, one-dimensional curve and by differentiating through that uh, uh, integration, you can actually find a way to uh, get fi find that curve. So uh, let me uh, you can explore that later. So now move on to something more serious: differentiable programming tensor networks. So tensor networks, uh, as we already learned. Um, they are useful for statistical physics, quantum physics, machine learning, and more. So, uh, and uh, in tensor networks, the elementary operations usually is a uh, contraction and uh, some matrix factorization. Actually, all of those things can be differentiable, so nothing prevents us to differentiate through many of the tensor network calculations. So let me show you uh, a few examples. So first of all, tensor networks, they uh, were already used for solving statistical physics problems, for example, icing model. So here, uh, the particular way, um, so, so basically we express the partition function of icing model as an infinite tensor network. And by contracting all the tensors, we got one number, that is the partition function. So um, that's one way to contract such a tensor network. So it's called tensor renormalization group. Essentially, it cross grains all those tensors. So you shrink the size exponentially uh, until you get a few tensors. So uh, you can expand the whole renormalization group um, procedure. Then you'll see it's actually, a, you basically you view that as a computation graph where the input is a single parameter for the icing model that is the inverse temperature while the output is the free energy log z. So the depth of such a competition graph is the same thing as the RG step, where for each RG step, we do truncated SVD and contracting and so on. But we, in this way, we can just almost blindly apply differentiable programming and get the first order and second order gradient of log z with respect to beta. That gives us the physical quantities, right? The energy and the specific heat. So um, conventionally, people was com usually computing, uh, usually compute the uh, specific heat. Uh, you find that difference, but here you don't have to do that. So this is a tiny um, application. So computing physical observables as a gradient of a tensor network contraction. And here's something more um, serious that was for the quantum ground state application, because we know that ground, uh, tensor networks can be used um, to model many particle ground state. And uh, here, uh, the goal is to solve an optimization problem where you, want, you get the ground state. While uh, one of the very nice way to uh, do that certainly is to find out the gradient. Why, but, but, but conventionally people uh, compute those gradient manually and analytically, which involves quite a tedious uh, infinite series sum. This, I would say, um, uh, inhibits many of the uh, applications of those nice technique to uh, complex and more realistic problem. But now, uh, with the visual programming, you just uh, apply those mechanism um, to your contraction uh, program where you get a gradient of the energy with respect to the rational answers. You see that in this way you do get a, a very low and accurate uh, rational energy. Uh, I would also compare this uh, with another, I would say more almost a perpendicular orthogonal uh, direction that is applying neural networks as uh, uh, answers for the many particle wave function. You see, uh, that was uh, Calio and Choya's uh, science paper uh, a few years ago for a uh, neural network. The accuracy for the same problem, that is the Heisenberg model, you get 
close to the 10 to the minus 3 accuracy, while 10 to the minus 3 is somewhere here, and this is already in the thermodynamic limit. So then I would say uh, uh, the idea of using uh, automatic differentiation, differential programming, uh, optimization for the tensor networks uh, has a great potential uh, of solving uh, useful problems in quantum mechanical uh, particle uh, um, research. Actually, there were already a few um, um, other developments of frustrated magnet, fermions, and even thermodynamics. So uh, there were some details for those uh, applications. It's not uh, uh, as simple as just a blindly apply gradient, but I leave that for discussion. And uh, by the way, there's besides all those uh, um, uh, motivations, there, there are at least some technical motivations for us to consider uh, applying differential programming to tensor networks. That is, if you think about the engine, the key uh, technical progress um, behind deep learning. So advanced, a technical advance behind deep learning, uh, usually people mention to, to your software and hardware. But I, what are those software and hardware? So they are actually differentiable tensors uh, running on specialized hardware, GPU and TPU. That already means uh, many of those uh, um, techniques and framework, framework, they can be equally transformative for tensor network applications. Um, we already saw those Google Tensor Network. That's uh, actually, I would say, a uh, very promising uh, direction to build up that for the whole community. So in the um, left, just a few minutes left, I'd like to uh, uh, switch direction because I was always talking about importing machine learning ideas, techniques for solving physics problems. But uh, uh, in this symposium, we heard many um, of those uh, applications of tensor network uh, architecture and tensor network algorithms for machine learning. So um, let me uh, also uh, mention to you some of our effort uh, in this direction. So this is uh, for the unsupervised uh, modeling, uh, generative modeling. So the goal is to minimize the negative log likelihood. So it's basically a density estimation. So those are the machine learning architectures, uh, autoregressive model, pixel CNN, and deep Boltzmann machine, restricted Boltzmann machine, many of the familiar and famous architectures. So our first attempt was using matrix product state. So you do see, um, um, even though it had a certain uh, sampling and the training uh, advantages, but the score here is actually obviously terrible. And later on, we improved that uh, with three tensor networks, bring that down a little bit. That's a test NIR. And uh, I would say uh, almost uh, uh, obviously that uh, uh, for two dimensional imaging, uh, a good idea is to use uh, two dimensional prow that is using a PEPS. Certainly, we tried that. And uh, for uh, computational efficiency considerations, we restrict these parameters to be positive. So that's a positive PEPS. And uh, 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 to model uh, probability with this positive PEPS, um, it's quite straightforward. And the uh, training of it, uh, in principle, we can get around all those uh, so-called uh, uh, intractable normalization factor because basically that's a contracting of finite PEPs, which we know how to do approximately, right? MPS and PO approach. So um, we uh, did that. So it was a quite uh, uh, um, brief uh, step because for each of the training epoch, we have to contract this 28 by 28 PEPs uh, 60,000 times because for each of the images, we have to contract it once. So this is quite time consuming, but we still did that. In the end, we got uh, this number. So it's not uh, um, <laughs> better than RBM even. But anyway, uh, this was uh, more or less uh, the best we can got um, two years ago. And by the way, then we got digested and uh, spent uh, uh, lots of time
of using this approach to solve to solve physics problems. So by the way, uh, uh, Pixel CNN and MPS they had a way to direct sample them, and perhaps in principle, since we can compute the partition function and also the marginals, we can also sample them one by one. So here's a sample of perhaps. So it's not uh, as good looking as uh, the state of the art. We still had a huge gap, obviously, compared to the state of the art, and. Uh, Mm, I would say we still need new ideas so um, to make it really useful, at least in uh, this uh, way, in this narrow sense. So uh, let me leave uh, this quote of uh, Mario Sagetti uh, that tensor network is the 21st century's uh, matrix. I think it's a, a um, quite fundamental tool from um, computational mathematics sense. Um, also, because of nice connection, connection to neural networks and to quantum circuits, I think it's uh, uh, a good time for many of us, uh, not only physicists, to learn about tensor networks. So thank you. Let me uh, stop here.